We, we're going to have the, the final lecture given by our keynote speaker, Ted Peters from Center for Theology and Natural Sciences in, uh, on Graduate Theological Union, Berkeley, California. And Ted will give a talk on natural science in public Christian philosophy and public systematic theology. Natural science in public Christian philosophy and public systematic theology. Welcome. Hello, I am Ted Peters. And as we think together about the future of Christian philosophy, we recognize that we live in a global culture that is crisscrossed everywhere by competing worldviews, incompatible worldviews and ide ideologies and political persuasions and, of course, advertising. What should a person believe? One characteristic of this cavalcade of competing worldviews is incoherence. One thing a philosopher is good at is coherence. What we will do now is take a look at the public face of Christian philosophy and Accompany that with a public face of Christian systematic theology. I think these two can partner. We might think of Christian philosophy as the form and systematic theology as the substance. Fasten your seatbelt. We're going to take a, an exciting ride. I come to you from Berkeley, California, in the United States. Here at the Graduate Theological Union, just north of the University of California at Berkeley, my colleague, Robert John Russell, and I edit this journal, Theology and Science, on behalf of the Center for Theology and the Natural Sciences, which for nearly four decades now has engaged in education, we bring scientists together with philosophers and theologians and ethicists to dialogue on matters of common interest. You'll notice the unfinished Golden Gate Bridge on the cover. One end is science and the other end is theology. There's a hiatus in the middle. Our goal is to finish the bridge. So the traffic goes two directions, from science to theology and theology back to science. I've only visited the fair city of Krakow once before. It was at the invitation of Jesuit Michael Heller and His Holiness Pope John Paul II for almost two decades. We at the Center for Theology and the Natural Sciences teamed up with the Vatican Observatory to carry on a series of studies on divine action in the natural world. In one of our meetings, we met at Krakow to discuss the question of neuroscience and the human person. We brought together some brain researchers, Joseph Ledoux and cognitive scientist uh, Michael Abib, we asked them to present the latest in neuroscientific research. 
We had, of course, philosophers in the Thomistic tradition, theologians, both Roman Catholic and Protestant. After about two days, we found the dialogue just wasn't working. (laughs) We like to have a creative mutual interaction between the scientists and the non-scientists. It wasn't working. So Under the leadership of Philip Clayton, one of the experts in this field, we paused the seminar. We went around the room to try to figure out what the problem is. Why no Anklipfungspunk? Why no connection? And the scientists said the following. Are you ready? You, philosophers and theologians, you want to understand human nature. We scientists don't study human nature. We just study how the brain works. (laughs) So the hiatus are split between laboratory science on the one hand and anthropology, philosophical or theological anthropology on the other. Pretty big. Be that as it may, we did put together the, uh, the findings of that conference in this particular book uh, published by the Vatican uh, City State and uh, CTNS in Berkeley. That's my one trip to Krakow. If there is any passage in Scripture which justifies Christian philosophy and apologetic theology, it's certainly this one. First. Peter 3.15 Always be ready to make your defense to anyone who demands from you an accounting for the hope that is in you. What is Christian philosophy? Let's try to answer that question by looking at some Examples. Here's one. 1880s, the United States, the editorial policy of the Journal of Christian Philosophy. This journal will support the theistic argument with special reference to the multiplied proofs afforded by the progress and discoveries of science, natural history, biology, and psychology for the existence of character, and plan of God. This journal will counteract all tendencies toward doubt, skepticism, unbelief, atheism, agnosticism, and the many forms of current infidelity. In short, directly to build the foundations and strengthen the defense of the kingdom of God the kingdom of God. The public is not the church. No, the public this Christian philosophy is addressing is the wider culture while the kingdom of God is getting built. What is Christian philosophy? Pavel Tarashevich says Christian philosophy is possible today only if, one, it is not identified with the art of persuasion as its final end lies in gaining understanding rather than being convincing. Understanding rather than being persuasive. Number two, it is the work of a Christian. Number three, it has the real world as its object and metaphysics as its method. I would like to point out that for Mitzislav Albert Kampiach, truth and explanation go hand in hand, the turning point toward a philosophy does not fear seeking the truth and explaining reality. Explanation. 
the task of the Christian philosopher. Meet Alvin Plantiga, champion of reformed epistemology. For Plantiga, Christian philosophy has four divisions. The first one is apologetic, second, philosophical theology, third, Christian philosophical criticism, and fourth, constructive Christian philosophy. Apologetics, very important here, divided into negative and positive. Negative apologetics defends the theistic arguments from external attacks. Positive apologetics, of course, engages in the construction of these theistic arguments. The two rivals that Alvin Plantinga wishes to confront are perennial naturalism and creative anti-realism we will deal with perennial naturalism in what is to come in the form of scientism, the denial that there is anything to reality beyond nature, creative anti-realism, that's relativism or pluralism or deconstructionist postmodernism. We will not deal with that in this particular presentation. Bob Bella the sociologist of religion, how does he describe the global crisis? What I think we have is a crisis of incoherence. Maurice Tabachek, Dominican at the Angelicum, the Dominican Pontifical University, wants to keep a rather sharp line between philosophy on the one hand and theology on the other. Philosophy provides a critical and in-depth analysis and description of the reality of the universe, both in its material and immaterial aspects. Since philosophy speaks about the reality of the universe, it does not have to say anything about what transcends it. That is, philosophy should not introduce the transcendental category of God. Obviously, this doesn't refer to the transcendent categories of good, beauty, truth, etc., because these are allowed and even desired by the philosopher. So as such, philosophy may address the phenomenon of religion, or even the idea idea of God, not God in God's self, but the idea of God that religious people have. This happens already within the philosophy of religion. Also in metaphysics, such as Aristotle's, where we find the idea of the first mover, we are examining basically a human phenomenon rather than God in God's self. So, Maurice argues that philosophers concentrate on the mundane and the human phenomenon of religion and religious practices and human images of God and maybe even attempts to prove God's existence, but always with reference to mundane reality. Theology in contrast takes as its point of departure divine revelation and the deep conviction and faith that God exists. Maurice sees theology as taking the fact of God's existence as given and thereby leads to a broader view of reality than philosophy alone can provide. Now that's going to be the theme here, whether it's philosophy or natural science. Once we bring God into the discussion, we have the opportunity, if not the obligation, to provide a more comprehensive view of reality than strict 
concentration on the mundane only can yield. My recommendation here in this presentation is that the Christian philosopher and the systematic theologian partner as they turn to look towards the wider public, turn away from the church and the academy toward the wider public. That means the Christian philosopher will provide the form while the systematic theologian provides the substance. Ordinarily, within systematic theology, we organized doctrinal presentation according to the three articles of the Apostles of Nicene Creed. Article 1, God in creation. Article 2, the person and work of Christ. Article 3, the Holy Spirit, and then everything else that was not previously included. The epilogue has to do with ethics in the Christian life, but the prologue, the propedeutic, uh, that's where the systematic theologian has traditionally included the work of the philosopher, answering the question, what does it mean to believe? How is it that we know anything about the God in whom we place our belief? In Protestantism, this is called philosophical theology. For the Roman Catholics, it's called fundamental theology. In both cases, methodology could be apologetic in character, both negatively defending Christian claims and then positively as constructing theistic arguments. So... Traditionally, the Christian philosopher is providing a propedeutic to what then becomes doctrinal explication. I'm going to suggest that perhaps as we turn our faces towards the wider public, that maybe the philosopher can provide the form, and the systematic theologian, the substance of the worldview that we're going to try to construct that would be intelligible and meaningful outside the church. Meet David Tracy. David was my doctor father at the University of Chicago. David claims that the Christian theologian has three publics talking from and talking to the church, the academy or the university, and the wider culture. What I'm emphasizing in this particular presentation is that both the Christian philosopher and the systematic theologian need to think about the culture, the wider culture, as the public. What is characteristic of our culture in the present moment is that our cell phones and our computers are lighting up constantly with an incoherent cacophony a chaos of competing worldviews. Christian philosophers and systematic theologians are good, competent, when it comes to putting together a coherent worldview. Is it possible that we could think that that talent could be of value not just to the church, but to the culture beyond the church. And if that's true, can we talk about public Christian philosophy and public systematic theology? Yes, I think we can. Here is my working definition of public 
theology, you'll see David Tracy's three publics providing the structure. Public theology is conceived in the church, reflected on critically in the academy, and meshed within the wider culture for the benefit of the wider culture. Science, authentic science at its best, pursues the truth, humbly pursues the truth. Yosef Tishnah, the fundamental property of scientific truth is its universality. Scientific truth is the truth for everyone. Basic truths are the same for all people. This should make scientific reason particularly attractive to the Christian philosopher and the systematic theologian. Truth cannot contradict truth, says St. John Paul II, sincerely engaged in the dialogue between natural science and the Christian faith. Now, Copernicus certainly do something about worldview construction. We will turn now to discourse clarification and distinguishing between authentic science on the one hand and naturalism in the guise of scientism on the other hand. A general in the army marching against religion is Edward O. Wilson, etymologist and sociobiologist at Harvard, who blurs the line between authentic scientific research on the one hand and scientism as a naturalistic ideology on the other hand, and he is committed to all-out war, what he calls Armageddon. The Armageddon in the conflict between science and religion began in earnest during the late 20th century. It is the attempt by scientists to explain religion to its foundation. Please flag that. Note what's going on here. He's a military general leading the army against religion, and his chief weapon is what? To provide a scientific explanation of religion. If you want to know what religion is, you don't ask a theologian, you ask a scientist. There is going to be a battle, a battle between explanations. Explain religion to its foundations, at its source, says Dr. Wilson. The struggle is not between people, but between worldviews. St. John Paul II engages in discourse clarification. Scientism, he says, is a philosophical problem, not a scientific problem. Scientism is the philosophical notion which refuses to admit the validity of forms of knowledge other than those of the positive sciences, and it relegates religious, theological, ethical, and aesthetic knowledge to the realm of mere fantasy. Many of our scientists around the world these days believe that they are under siege. There are enemies out to get them. What are the enemies that these scientists perceive? One is the wider culture. The scientists have been forecasting for more than half a century climate change, the heating up of the planet, the degradation of the planet, the 
crossing of thresholds that will prevent recovery of our planet's ability to sustain life and economic vested interests will not believe the scientists' prophetic warnings. That's part of the war against science. In the current global crisis over the virus SARS-CoV-2 and the disease COVID-19, Many political leaders refuse to take the advice and counsel of our best medical researchers and public health officials and even attack the reputation of the World Health Organization. That's part of the war against science. Then there are the anti-vaccinators, those who refuse to believe that vaccinations are good for the health of their children and the health of society. It's also the case that in some Islamic countries, there are government crackdowns on freedom of speech and the ability of science conferences to feature prominent women scientists in public, more signs of a war against science. Do not confuse the war against science with the so-called war between science and religion. They're two different things. Is it accurate to say that there is an all-out war going on between science and religion? No, says Joshua Moritz, the managing editor of the journal Theology and Science. The narrative that science and religion are at war is a myth in two key senses of the word. It is foundational to a certain anti-religious worldview, that's the worldview we've identified as scientism, and is historically false. It's not the case historically, that there is a perpetual warfare between natural science and religion in general, let alone the Christian religion in particular. As public Christian theology and as public systematic theology, we have been concerned up until this point with scientism, what Alvin Plantinga calls perennial naturalism, the belief that the natural world is the only reality there is, and science is the only way of knowing that reality. We could say nature is the reality and science is its prophet. Nevertheless, when we address the wider culture, we can work with a certain assumption, namely that there is a certain receptivity on the part of the human race for matters that are spiritual or religious. Mircea Eliade, the great history of religion scholar at the uh, University of Chicago, had called the human being, homo religiosus, we are religious by nature. John Calvin, the Protestant reformer, says that there is within the human breast a divinitatis sensum, a sense of the divine. These suggest that when the Christian philosopher, the systematic theologian, says something about God, ears are going to be open to listen. One of the tasks of the ideology of scientism or perennial naturalism is to close those ears. Here's St. John Paul II again, who also holds this position. Religion is the expression of a search that goes beyond what is visible toward an unknown God. 
This course clarification and worldview construction just may get some level of reception on the part of open ears if the Christian philosopher turns public and the systematic theologian turns public. Public systematic theology has a distinctively constructive function, but that word construction is under contention. There is a school of theological thought that wants to file a patent and own this term with a specific definition. According to the school of thought, constructive theology accepts with the essential diversity of theological claims and opinions as a strength rather than as a fatal flaw or heresy and as abandoning systematic implies. So they're going to abandon systematic theology. Constructive theology refuses any pretense that suggests theology can be completely systematized and every doctrine logically cohered into a grand system. Logic and coherence are being rejected in its extreme form. They're rejecting the meta-narrative and supporting local narratives, a plurality of local narratives that is not organized coherently or logically into a single worldview. This particular brand of constructive theology belongs in the camp that philosopher Alvin Plantica calls creative non-realism. The worldview construction I'm suggesting here belongs in the creative realism camp, not the creative anti-realism camp. Do we need a worldview? We sure do, according to philosopher and Christian theologian Nancy Murphy at Fuller Theological Seminary in Pasadena, California. Not only that, she will argue that a worldview that includes God is more comprehensive and more coherent than any of the competitors. We are blessed on the front end of the 21st century with a giant library of new and exciting discoveries produced by the natural sciences, discoveries which give us greater and greater insight into the nature of reality in its many dimensions. Most exciting for the systematic theologian, of course, is going to be Big Bang cosmology and star formation and the question of extraterrestrial life or evolution and its implications for theological anthropology and neuroscience similarly with its implications for theological anthropology. There is excitement, enough excitement to go around for everybody in the natural sciences. But as the public Christian philosopher and the public systematic theologian engage in discourse clarification, as well as worldview construction, scientific claims are treated critically. There's a creative mutual interaction between 
scientific claims on the one hand and what the Christian might have gained through special revelation on the other hand. Here is Nancy Murphy again, the philosopher and the Christian theologian at Fuller Seminary, teaming up with George Ellis, who's a mathematical cosmologist, to co-author a constructive worldview. And here they are dealing with the fine-tuning of the cosmological constants. That's a discussion arising from the 1970s down to the present time about the initial conditions at the Big Bang if they would have been just a fraction different, the universe we live in would not have ever developed the potential for life. And you and I wouldn't be here. It's an amazing set of constants, even if you're just a scientist and not a theologian. They are called the gosh numbers. So here we are, with Murphy and Ellis engaging in disclosure, the apparent fine-tuning of the cosmological constants to produce a life-bearing universe called the anthropic principle, they call it the anthropic issue here, seems to call for an explanation, okay? So they're going to engage in what I'm calling an explanation planetary adequacy, a theistic explanation allows for a more coherent, coherence, that's a good thing, right? A more adequate explanation is going to have greater coherence than its competitors. A theistic explanation allows for a more coherent account of reality than does a non-theistic account. God appears to work in concert with nature never overriding or violating the very processes that God has created. It implies a kenotic. Now, this is um, something that is distinctive to Murphy and Ellis. The kenosis passage in Philippians chapter 2 describes Christ as emptying himself of divinity And so what Murphy and Ellis have done is describe that as a trait of God. God is self-renunciatory in character, okay? So they're now going to draw out the implications of a canonic God. It implies a canonic or self-renunciatory ethic according to which one must renounce self-interest for the sake of the other, no matter what the cost to oneself. Hence, new research programs are called for in these fields. So the theologian is now crossing the bridge towards science by suggesting productive research programs to be carried on by the scientists. Hence, new research programs are called for in these fields, exploring the possibilities for human sociality in light of a vision modeled on God's own self-sacrificing love. So we have a worldview constructed on the basis of God's canonic or self-sacrificing love, and then a suggestion for research in the scientists to look at, examine sociality and the self-sacrificial dimension in sociality. This is explanatory adequacy at work in worldview construction. This is Robert John Russell. He's holding in his hand an original edition of Galileo's Dialogue on Two World Systems. It's Dr. Russell that gave us the term creative mutual interaction or CMI. If you can Remember the image of the bridge. We want traffic to go two ways. 
science toward theology and theology toward science in a creative, mutual interaction. As I mentioned earlier, Pope John Paul II took a direct interest in the creative mutual interaction between science and theology. He thinks each could purify the other. Science can purify religion from error and superstition. Religion can purify science from idolatry and false absolutes. Each can draw the other into a wider world, a world in which both can flourish. A theologically informed worldview could provide greater explanatory adequacy than a worldview which deletes from its picture the God of grace. Both the public Christian philosopher and the public systematic theologian have this to offer our wider culture. By what criteria do we measure explanatory adequacy? Well, there are four. The first is applicability. This is the empirical criterion. Does it bite into actual experience? How comprehensive is it? In principle, we should be able to look at any and all of reality in relationship to God. Logical, we want to avoid self-contradiction. Coherence is the principle whereby any doctrinal articulation implies every other one. So if you want to enter the house of systematic theology, you can go through any door or window and find your way everywhere. Yes, there's an unavoidable perspectivalness to the Christian philosopher and the systematic theologian, but because it seeks the most comprehensive scope, it's a perspective on the whole of reality. And will it have to change? Oh, yes. It is in constant movement, just as scientific theories are. So what we say theologically has a certain hypothetical structure to it to be confirmed or disconfirmed either by experience or God's revelation. Perhaps St. Thomas Aquinas provides a good model. But in sacred science, all things are treated under the aspect of God, either because they are God himself or because they are ordered to God as their beginning and end. My public Christian philosophy and public systematic theology partner in addressing the wider public, the wider culture beyond the church in this era of competing worldviews and incoherence, might we have something valuable to say about the whole of reality and about the gracious God who is our creator and our redeemer. With that, bye-bye. That was uh, Ted Peters from Graduate Theological Union, Berkeley, California. Thank you very much, Ted. Now we can start with the questions. Uh, so if, if uh, some of you have some questions, just please unmute yourself, ask the question, and mute yourself again. Uh, we will start with the questions on WebEx, from WebEx participants, and I will, I will read some uh, questions uh, from YouTube and Facebook streams. So just please unmute yourself and ask the questions.
Ted, greetings. This is John Hittinger from Houston, Texas, not too far from you. I've got, I've got a question. You, Ted. And that is, um, why, I, what will lead scientists to engage this worldview kind of conversation? You know, you had mentioned, for example, um, Wilson and his book Consilience, he seems to be so satisfied with his work. He even, a little quote I want to read you, he says, the true evolutionary epic retold as poetry is intrinsically ennobling as any religious epic. Material reality discovered by science possesses more content and grandeur than all the religious cosmologies combined. And he seems to think it won't happen today or tomorrow. He's perfectly happy with an incomplete explanatory system, but he thinks he's got that promissory note that he will explain everything down to the roots. So how do you get a handle on someone who is so entrenched in this idea of the reductive explanations? And then he says he'll turn it into poetry. So what do you do? Uh, my uh, term to describe uh, E.O. Wilson is scientific imperialism. That is to say, um, <clears throat> science is the only explanation for reality. Everything else is fantasy. And uh, so he takes the so-called science of biological evolution, and he wants to conquer <laughs> religious self-understanding by providing an evolutionary understanding and by translating the science of evolution into poetry. He thinks he can convert religious people to a new form of religion, namely um, scientism. Um, if you want to persuade Wilson that he's mistaken, it may be hopeless, um, because um, his scientism is an ideology to which he's committed. Does every research scientist have to hold Eel Wilson's point of view? I don't, I don't think so. Uh, scientists can recognize the value of scientific knowledge without adding to it uh, the demand that you turn your knowledge into a single imperial form of knowledge that defeats um, uh, all competitors. It is possible uh, for a serious research scientist to believe in God, like God, think of God as a uh, creator, etc., and let science be science. I think we're in a curious situation where the public Christian philosopher and the public Christian theologian are, tra are telling the scientists, keep your science, do your science, and then quit. Don't add pseudo-religion of materialism or scientism on top of it. Um, so that's my interpretation of that passage of Consilience. The book is misnamed because it's really a form of E.O. Wilson's imperialism in which all forms of knowledge are united, but united in his own <laughs> worldview uh, because he doesn't allow um, credence to alternatives. Now, do you think I'm too extreme here, uh, John, in my interpretation? Or? No, no, I would agree. I like what you say, and I, I like the work of Father Yaki. Do you know his work? Oh, he has that, Yaki, yeah. yes, right. He, he makes that argument, let science be science and philosophy be philosophy, and that's, that's one of the lessons that has to be learned, is that the method of science has a limit by definition. And yes, it, it does. Yeah. That's it's right. It's quantitative. It's, uh, 
So uh, anyway, no, thank you, Ted. That was a, uh, I'm glad you brought Wilson up. I think he's an important figure. Yes, he is. He is. Consider. Very representative. Uh, are there any questions? For I have received two questions on the stream. So I will read it. And if there will be any another, then we will just go to them. The first question, Ted, is... Would you say that the task of Christian philosophy is to make a change in the world, to make to make a world a better place to live, or rather to provide us with an explanation with a Christian insight? That was the first question. I think traditionally it's been the latter. We want better understanding, and understanding leads to explanation. Understanding, judgment explanation and if the christian philosopher can do that um uh, he or she's had a good day <laughs> okay i think that currently in the global situation there's so much incoherence and christian philosophers are good at coherence systematic theologians are good at coherence that maybe we could be good stewards of this talent and somehow or other offer it to the world outside our disciplines. Okay, and the latter question is, does science care about philosophy, theology, its methodologies, ethical suggestions, or interpretations? Methodologically, no. Methodologically, science is self-limiting. It does not even deal with value. Now, many scientists are very concerned about value, ethics, and things like that. But that's an extra scientific concern. It's not inherent in the science itself. Okay. Are there any questions? Anna, please. It's not a question. It's rather a remark of a person who doesn't come from... Uh, in English language mentality. Uh, I, must, uh, I myself came from a family with a very long tradition of maths and physics. So, so the family of scientists, the professionals. And uh, my mother language is Russian. Then I started to learn English. I found it quite amusing and astonishing when somebody can formulate in English the following sentence, I do believe in science. For me, the sentence, as I said, is amusing. Science is nothing to believe in. I can agree or disagree. I can measure, I can, uh, for, for instance, I do believe in climate change. There is nothing to believe in. We have some facts. We have different models. We can accept one of models to explain some facts. But there is no uh, matter to believe in. Uh, science is not a matter of fate. And this, I, you know, I started from such um, very simple things that I just noticed on the level of language. And then I moved to say, I... Um, found out that it's not only a matter of language, which I probably didn't understand all those nuances, but that people really do think that they do believe in science or do not believe in science. Then they have such an attitude. The next step, which is uh, scientism, etc., etc., is very easy to do. They already got an idea that uh, there is something to believe in. You know, I believe in physics. Or I believe in Einstein, for instance. For me, it's, uh, you know, I don't believe that two and two uh, is equal four. I just know it. I can prove it. However, it's not that easy as someone would think, but, you know, in any case. So, uh, sometimes I, I have think that this discussion is somehow rooted in quite different mentality, which is also the mentality of language. This is what I can say to this discussion. Well, um, I think uh, this is a very valuable um, uh, observation. Uh, internal to uh, research methods in science, 
you're right. There is no room for belief at all. Belief plays no role uh, whatsoever. There are two ways, though, in which belief in science um, does have some cash value. The first one is philosophers of science point out that the scientific method makes certain assumptions, such as the mind is rational and the, the world studied empirically conforms to those rational principles. That's an unproven assumption, and the word belief can apply uh, there. Again, it's not internal, but it's external to um, science itself. Secondly, I think in the world situation which we are currently uh, facing today, science is a part of culture, and uh, we're finding that the authority of science to provide reliable information and explanation that is to guide politics, economics, and um, uh, other aspects of culture, that authority has been eroded, and we're stuck, whether we like it or not, with whether people believe the scientists or not. Um, we have this big problem in the United States. Maybe you don't have it in Poland, but we have a president <laughs> who doesn't believe in science and says the scientists are wrong, and he just knows intuitively what is what is right. So in that sense, um, we're going to have to use the word belief in science or disbelief in science for a period of time until we can discern just what authority science has in the non-scientific aspects of culture. But it is something different to have a set of axioms which you need to have in any well, science or any uh, scientific discipline. It's important that we have a set of axioms in philosophy, the minimum set, without which uh, argumentation is simply impossible, which you accept as necessary. The other thing is to believe in science or, or, or not to believe in science. Both well, subjects are quite different. Again, I don't believe in axioms. I do accept them as or self-evident, as in geometry, for instance, speaking about classical geometry, yes, or as necessary in modern physics. This is, however, not the same. And then, I, uh, well, for instance, you uh, give us example of uh, Trump. I can uh, equally give you an example of Ocasio Cortez. She does believe in science. She doesn't know science, but she does believe in science. And for me, what he says, what she projects, is uh, not more scientific than Trump's theories. It's loosely based on science without any knowledge or understanding of science. So uh, it, it, it's, it's like uh, our custom gives people who think, uh, who are scientists, a permission to cross the boundaries between disciplines. Me, as philosopher or theologian, would never tell a to a scientist how to do methodologically or not something, yes. It's not my discipline. I'm, qu I'm quite aware about my limits. And yet, it's difficult to find a scientist who would equally uh, preserve his limits. I don't think that uh, a person who works in, ph in physics or in any other scientific discipline has rights, methodological rights to make philosophical or theological claims. Simply, the methodology is different. That's it. And, uh, but, you know, you, this, you have this um, common mentality climate, you know, then, then science is a kind of belief. 
So I, I, I don't know. Maybe I'm not. No, I'm not right. Just it. it I was um, so much surprised, surprised to find those differences in mentality. But I am probably not ready to get over it. No. <laughs> Well, thank you. I, I'll accept your description. <laughs> okay, um, we we are running out of time. The very last question, Ted, we received on Facebook stream is following. It seems hard in the real issues to decide whether science is apolitical. Take the issues of vaccines. Isn't this a case of believing that the research is objective, not funded by the pharmaceutical companies? Um, yes, I think this is another way in which belief functions, even though I will accept Anna's description of the internal method of science as exclusive of belief on any given research project, to be sure. But um, the anti-vaccination movement was founded, and I don't know the details, on a spurious scientific study later disproved. So the anti-vaccinator believes that he or she is basing this position on science. It does not think that the anti-vaccination position is anti-science. They think it's better science. Establishment science Scientists say they're mistaken. Um, uh, but the idea that there'd be a competition between um, research projects is not unusual within science, but you expect empirical evidence and good reasoning uh, to win, uh, win out someday. So there's no anti-science in the mindset of the anti-vaccinators that I can tell. Okay, the, the very last question, I promise, from John Hittinger. John? No, I just wanted to briefly say in part for Anna, but also Ted could comment that I think in the United States, the phrase belief in science is mostly connected to technology. I think what it means is I believe science will solve this problem. You know, here in Houston, MD Anderson has cancer with a red line through it. We will solve the problem of cancer. And I think there's a kind of belief to the future that science will solve the major problems of mankind. That's how I understand it. And I, I mean, I think I question that belief, but I think it's a lot, it's a coherent idea. And it's not just I believe scientific propositions, but I believe science is our savior or science will do the things we need to have happen. Um, I, I would occur, I don't want to interrupt Anna, but yeah, I, that's belief in progress, faith in progress, and it really comes from the image of technology, uh, but science is conflated with technology uh, in the belief that science will save us. Okay, let's let's put uh, a dot. I, I, I'm sorry, I need to add something. And yet, science becomes a savior. Uh, you do not see uh, some problem with it. You yes. just utter this. Science becomes a savior. <laughs> oh, it's a form of idolatry. Science will not save, despite the fact that people believe it will. <laughs> 